All right, man, Mr. Dandelion, how you doing? How's it going, man? Good to uh, hang out. Good to be with you. Yeah, man, show me a little bit about uh, what you're doing right now. Cool. Well, I'm at my herbal apothecary, and I stop by here every once in a while. And basically, I'll travel around and forage and then stock up the van with uh, herbal goods and then travel around, teach, and uh, sell herbal goodies and then come back to the apothecary with a whole bunch of bags full of herbs and uh, take like three to five days and just go crazy on making medicines. So kind of in the mode of stocking up the apothecary. Holy cow. Here's one cabinet here. You've got all the mason jars, all of them. <laughs> uh, an herbalist in their ball jars. And then I've got another cabinet here, which is pretty dark. So this is all loaded with all kinds of good features. And uh, today I was making a bunch of formula. Get ready to do this uh, opportunity this weekend. So here's a couple of the formulas I made. Uh, medicinal mushroom trinity, hormone balance, let's see, digestive ease, detura, uh, anointing oil, copal tincture. That's and, amazing. Uh, immuno magic. So my friend uh, helps with all the labels, my friend Lauren. So she's coming back soon and she'll make all the labels and then I'll stock up and head out for the weekend and take a couple months and tour around and teach damn Jersey. man you're so yeah. you're so busy is is lauren uh like your your only other help that you have uh currently yeah i mean i have a few friends who help at vending tables but yeah that's pretty much uh, the only solid person i've gotten roped into this uh chaos pretty much full time otherwise uh friends are down to help on occasion so very cool, very cool. So, man, you're so busy. All right, so you've got Return to Nature, where you, um, you know, your website. But, I mean, through that, the way you live is uh, you teach, you go and forage, you do what you're doing now, which is extract and cook. So, like, when what what do you do with your free time? Or not, you don't, do you have free time? Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because you make it sound really busy. Uh, but basically, like, on the weekends, I'll teach, you know, Saturday and Sunday, and then I have all week to travel and walk in the woods and wildcraft and harvest. So that to me doesn't really feel like anything too excessive or busy. And like camp out and bathe in streams and live in nature and, you know, GPS mark awesome campsites and places to park the van. And, uh, you know, this is kind of my busy week, let's say. So. Now I'm like restocking all the tinctures and everything and making formulas, which I love to do so much. It doesn't feel very much like work. So uh, I'm working on also a five mushroom blend. So this is maitake. So I wildcrafted all these maitake last season. And uh, this is the tincture portion, which I just strained out. And now I'm making a decoction portion here, uh, decocting that by half. And then I'll combine that. So that'll be another... Uh, uh, double extracted maitake or hen of the woods and then from there I want to make a five mushroom blend but now I'm out of chaga so now <laughs> where to get some chaga um, damn man so you got your work cut out for you and even yet uh, you still have time to post to social media and you're always you're always live streaming and teaching via those channels and I gotta give it to you man well thank you thank you you're a hard I, worker I, I really think that um, you know, the idea of using the social media stuff on the fly as I do this is easier than it's ever been. And I'm trying to kind of utilize that as a way to expand the teaching arena. And uh, I think that's really important to uh, create a dialogue around these things. Because, like, you know, 10 years ago, people had no ability really to connect to herbalism uh, or self-healing other than, like, you know, taking a course with somebody physically. But now there's just like such a rapid uh, spread of information and, and wisdom, and I love to be, you know, a link in that chain. Yeah, man, that's that's amazing. Um, now that we're on the subject of uh, your extracts, can you speak a bit, a little, a little bit about uh, a particular medicinal mushroom that you've got? Well, you know, I am just amazed by the medicinal virtues of uh, the medicinal and so I have and I work with Rishi, uh, Maitake or Hen of the Woods, um, Chaga and let's see Lion's Mane, 
there's got to be another oh and turkey tails so i wildcrafted all those and then i'll make them into double extracted tinctures or of course eat lots of wild mushrooms and um you know i just really feel like they're all very deeply healing so i i've gone through about four this is about my fourth gallon of reishi that i've made a double extract from and since i had it readily available i've literally taken tons of it for the last maybe six months to eight months and uh you know excessive doses uh but i don't think it's actually excessive i think that's actually the average dose but unfortunately the way the uh like medicinal mushroom market is set up i don't think that we have a lot of access to stuff that's affordable um so yeah. having that luxury of reishi has just completely felt like it's rebuilt my cell tissue you know, I mean, we all grew up in a position where we ate weird things, and I grew up on, like, Hot Pockets and macaroni and cheese and sure. microwave Pepsi sure. and stuff like that. And so I really feel like at that phase, I was really doing, like, a reishi mushroom detox cleanse, and I just felt like the old tissue, the old toxins in my lymphatic system um, just getting pulled out. Um, so I really feel like they're incredible medicinal teachers, especially if made uh you know into a double extract for example because it's so potentized from what it would be you know you make a reishi tea and you drink it one time and that's cool and it's pretty bitter and then if you make like a double extracted tincture it's just all day hitting dropper full after dropper full like six to eight droppers full a day on reishi it just really felt like it's deeply helped to uh detoxify my past so to speak yeah. So that's one of my favorites. Gotcha. Yeah, my uh, mom was experimenting with the Ganoderma mushrooms and uh, the reishi mushrooms that you're talking about, and she's uh, also has friends who swear by it. They're, they're, her friends are the ones that got her on it because they were swearing by the um, benefits of their blood pressure. And my mom uh, decided to experiment and start taking those mushrooms in replace of her uh, medicine, and she's seen results. She's she hasn't gone back on it, and I was just like, wow, okay. I mean, maybe there's That's something all. to it. Yeah. I mean, I know I there's mean, something to it. There's so much hearsay. Yeah. But, That's, well, there's all, a lot of research, you know. I mean, yeah. Paul Stamet's book, Myco Medicinals, is just an amazing research, uh, uh, um, amazing book on the research that they did in Japan and China. And really, you know, it's really important. So first of all, like, the basics are there is no Ganodermal lucidium now in North America. So... There are these three or four, maybe six Ganoderma species now mm -hmm. that we generally call reishi. The reishi mushroom proper is Ganoderma lucidium. Right. That's not in North America. Now we have Ganoderma aplanatum. We have Ganoderma tsuge. We have Ganoderma organensis. We have a couple others, and they're all very similar in their medicinal qualities. Yeah. What I think is the greatest disservice, like I'm such a talker of herbs and, and mushrooms, healing virtues, and literally when people ask me, like, what are they good for, which is a question I really don't like because that's like asking your grandmother what she's good for. Right, right, so right. Obviously, but when I think about, well, Rishi, you know, how can you apply it? Basically, it could be a baseline in a formula for anything. And sadly, what we have now, like, for example, the uh, turkey tail mushroom has the PSK, polysaccharide K. That's known to have done studies, I think, in Japan where they reduce the size of breast tumors. Now, that's sad in a way because we now think that turkey tail is for breast tumors. Mm -hmm. And that's the narrowness of the research, the clinical research that they did on one specific function and action. And really, I can't see a time when medicinal mushrooms wouldn't be uh, applicable, especially in cases of inflammation or autoimmunity, which we basically, every single person has inflammation and autoimmunity, or like just rebuilding and detoxifying the lymphatic system, which I think is really important. So, Yeah, yeah, great stuff, man. There's, they do a lot. It's not just like, what are they good for? Oh, food. Oh, uh, your blood pressure. It's, it's I mean, the they're an immunomodulatory which is basically yeah. addressing your entire immune uh, immune system and keeping it yeah. uh, keeping you from getting sick. Like I uh, I've got like upper respiratory issues. I got asthma and stuff. And so they say uh, you know to eat uh, start eating local honey um, mm -hmm. from the place you're gonna go visit a couple weeks prior before going. It'll help you with your allergies there, so you don't get sick. 
But also, yeah. you would you would want to take these immu immunomodulatory substances as well, so that it, it still it'll it'll soften the blow from you know the distance and the new ecology that you're gonna go visit. Amazing stuff. Yeah, and so that would be an application of maybe an acute condition where you're trying to go into an, an ecosystem and reduce symptoms, potential symptoms of somewhere else. But then there's also like the the chronic condition of living in a toxic world and being in a toxic environment constantly because the way we've built the environment and Absolutely. you know over time they're really also helpful for rebuilding the cell tissue in a really powerful way like immunomodulation is something that we're really just coming into the grips of understanding and basically you know balances the entire immune system that's probably a good thing for every single person so the question is can we ethically and sustainably harvest enough to meet the demands of everybody who's eaten you know microwave foods their whole life right 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 oh man there's a lot to be done there's a lot to be done um so i guess uh did we talk about how you got into naturalism like initially cool uh not so much we didn't but i'd love to share um Basically, my earliest childhood memories are like playing outside in nature, and my dad built me a fort, which was awesome. It was up in a tree. It's like a tree house. And then I had a sandbox that my dad also built. He was a carpenter. And then right next to that was a garden. So those were three really integral parts of my upbringing. And then also there was like a huge cornfield behind my parents' house. So that was just life. And... Um, I grew up that way, and then of course video games kicked in, and then the internet kicked in when I was like 14. I got my first computer, and you know, still played outside a lot, but that was kind of a, you know, a mediator. And then when I was about 18 or 19, I realized that you could look for mushrooms in the woods. It just suddenly dawned on me, and so I became obsessed with the idea of finding and photographing mushrooms, and just I found them so photogenic. I was always into photography. And uh, so my mom also grew a lot of plants and herbs all around the house, although she never really harvested them or worked with them very much. Uh, but they were all these ornamental herbs, you know. So I grew up with that kind of baseline understanding. And uh, from there, it really kicked in overdrive once I started looking for mushrooms. And some really basically interesting thing happened. I started going to this little plot of the woods by my parents' house. And I would go there and uh, I would bring like sage, white sage, and a smudge bowl that my grandmother gave me. And I would just like smudge the forest. It was like, you know, there was a lot of garbage around. And I, I feel like I made a pact with nature. And I said, if, if you teach me about mushrooms, I'll pick up garbage. And I would bring like a plastic bag there and I'd bring my smudge bowl and I would smudge and walk the trails and then I would see like colors out of the corners of my eyes and sometimes it was a mushroom and sometimes it was a piece of garbage yeah. and I ended over like two years really cleaning that place up and uh, luckily there was house in construction right outside of that area of the woods and so I just kept putting all the garbage in the dumpster that they had there um, coincidentally so after about, I think, three years, two years, three years of looking in those woods, I found my first mushrooms, which I had identified as edible, which are uh, the ringless honey mushrooms, Armorelia species. And I brought them home, and it was during a family party. And they were all like, oh, God, this guy's like going crazy over here. And so I cooked them up. I, of course, did a lot of systematic things like I think you should smell the mushrooms as they're cooking, make sure they're appetizing, make sure they really stimulate your digestive desire. Um, some mushrooms that are like misidentified could smell really bad or smell off or you know make you concerned. And then um, I cooked them up and I ate like two to three mushrooms and then I waited the next morning and I ate the rest. I remember like telling my mom like, okay, this is what I'm eating and I had like the rest of them there. If I get sick, you know, and I was like already 99.9% .9 sure that they were honey mushrooms, but I was like, if I get sick, this is the bag, like take me to the hospital and show them yeah, that. Yeah. Th that was all good, proper protocol. And of course I did fine and it was the right mushrooms. And then a couple of weeks later, my grandfather c casually mentioned, oh, it's so interesting. Where did you go to get those mushrooms? And I told him the place 
And um, actually, he he said that that's actually where my his grandparents, my grandfather's grandparents, used to come from Italy to actually go mushroom hunting. So it was actually my family's land back in the day, and I felt like I was like receiving their teachings through osmosis. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, I learned mushroom identification in my grandparents' grandparents' woods. Wow, which man, is man. Nice. <laughs> that's incredible like that's that's some uh i don't know some believe in coincidences and a lot of people even uh you know really financed it but that's that's some uh magical stuff there man there's a, a fun quote i forget who it's by um which says a coincidence is um what you have left over after you have a bad theory Oh, I've heard that. That's so good. I love it. Yeah, the idea is that, like, if there's a coincidence left over, you obviously have a model or a map that is insufficient to really tell you what's going on. So good. So, like, yeah, who was that? Uh, some old philosopher. I think I heard it from Terrence McKenna, who was quoting someone I can't remember. I, I could probably just Google the quote later. I'll probably, I'll probably let you know later if I Google it. Cool. Yeah, it's a good one. Coincidence is something that you have left over after uh, from a bad theory. So, of course, a coincidence is a really interesting thing because we say something like just a coincidence. But it's actually ridiculous because a coinciding, two factors that coincide, that's all it means. So if two things occur simultaneously and it feels significant, that's a coincidence. To say that that's irrelevant is, is not at all accurate. So... I don't know how we got the idea that a coincidence is a just. Of course, Carl Jung has a, a, a lot of writing on such things as well. So we all should follow that flow. I'm a big fan of you know letting letting go and letting nature kind of lead the way and guide us. And that's always how I found ridiculous amounts of mushrooms. You know, yeah. when I'm not look, when I'm not expecting, when I'm just kind of wandering and following a deer or looking at a squirrel or something and then I turn around and it's like whoa the mother load yeah for sure they they can but man, they just grow in huge numbers when you don't even expect it yeah i know exactly what you mean yeah. but um so is there any mushroom related misconception that you uh that really bothers you that you'd like to clear up oh my goodness yeah <laughs> uh, one one great one, which I've gotten some flack for, is that uh, no mushrooms are poisonous to the touch. Uh, that's something that people say often. Mm -hmm. It's totally ridiculous. Although somebody refuted that. I wrote it in an article, and someone made this very abstract refutation, which I understand, so I'll add that as a caveat. If you are uh, dealing with lactarious mushrooms, the, specifically the peppery milky and you're like damaging the gills, you get the milk on your, your finger and you like stick your finger in your nose or rub your eyes, you can be uh, harmed by that. Now that still doesn't mean they're poisonous to the touch, it means that you stuck your fingers in your eyes when you had some substance on <clears> you. <throat> it's actually very interesting recipes in Russia, they eat peppery milkies uh, after they leach them of their peppery flavor. So. They're not necessarily poisonous mushrooms. They are acrid mushrooms that shouldn't be eaten much. But other than peppery, milky wiping in your eyes, there is no poisonous mushroom to the touch. And this is something that, you know, part of the litany of fear-based things that we tell children to make them afraid of nature, you know, leaves of three, leave them be, or mushrooms can poison you if you touch them. No mushroom can poison you if you touch them. And leaves of three, leave them be should be, hey, kids, here's what poison ivy looks like. Not making them afraid of any plants with three leaves, which are also raspberries, strawberries, etc. So that's that's one of the ones that really, I think, is an un unnecessary thing to tell people. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, somebody on Facebook once said that there was a Japanese mushroom that's poisonous to smell. And I, I feel it's... I, I don't. I can't even remember the name, the supposed Latin name, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure I believe it now that I'm saying it. But I did read what people might find interesting. There is a. Oh man, I forgot. It was it's the the, the disease is called Lycoper, 
like coprononsis or something. And it's when you uh, breathe in a lot of spores at once and they get lodged into your respiratory system and give you this weird kind of asthma. I've, uh, I'll probably link up, link it up just because like, I thought it was really cool and I wanted to write about it and I probably will, but that's something yeah. to, yeah, go ahead. So that's always like, you know, if you're cutting wood and you inhale too much sawdust, the same thing is going to happen. It doesn't mean that mushrooms, of course you know this, but it doesn't mean that mushrooms are any less safe than going to the chemical cleaning agent aisle at the grocery store right. and reaching for each and knocking it on your face accidentally. Right. So, yes, you can have these very odd phenomena. I'm sure the people who have those are people who grow large amounts of mushrooms indoors or something. Yeah. Not going to be walking in the woods. Um, you know, there's also a very interesting thing which you bring to mind that uh, certain uh, calvatia, I believe, the uh, puffballs, actually the spores can be applied to cuts, I believe, uh, oddly enough. Uh, people have mentioned that to me. So, cool. yeah, there are these still, it's funny because like my original sentence means no mushroom is poisonous to touch. So, yeah, you can inhale trillions of spores yeah. and that can <laughs> Very issue, but still no mushroom is poisonous. But to just touch. to clear it up for listeners, yeah, you can eat, you can touch the deadly ones like the destroying angel and death cat. You can even chew a little bit in your mouth if you spit it out. Just don't swallow it. Um, right. But yeah, you can really, yeah. Go ahead. That's just called a nibble test. I've done it with, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, lepidellas, which are white yeah. amanitas, and they usually taste horrible but some people say that the death cap tastes delicious so uh, taste is not an ultimate indicator of um, whether a mushroom is edible but it often is an indicator of when a mushroom is not food so if it tastes horrible don't eat it but if it tastes good do more research yeah that, that's always kind of there you go that's pretty good man we i think we cleared up quite a few misconceptions there that was sweet but, um, hey, man, so before I let you go, um, just want to talk about a little bit how to get in touch with you, how people can reach you, and uh, speak a little bit about your GoFundMe page. Cool. Uh, so basically, I've had the vision of living in a forage mobile and getting a van and um, kind of decking it out into not only a podcasting studio, a music recording studio, but also a place that I can travel and teach out of. And so I'm kind of in phase two of that where uh, on uh, www.gofundme.com backslash return to nature, there is my whole proposal and I raised about $13,000, which sadly is only half of the cost of the van. So I'm trying to raise money now to put solar panels on it and get electrical in there mm -hmm. and put a seat in and do the flooring and then um, uh, deck the walls and put insulation so that I can do a West Coast tour sometime e either in the winter or the spring. So if you're interested, you can check that out. I've got a lot of herbal goods on there, a lot of incentives uh, to donate on there. And uh, my website is returntonature.us. I'm also on Facebook, Return to Nature Skills. Uh, lots of good things going on there. Always teaching on Instagram as well, instagram.com backslash return to nature. Uh, my email is dan at return to nature .us. Anyone can always feel free to email. And, uh, you know, I'm always touring around and teaching and always open and curious to new places to go. So if you've got some favorite places and you want to see me get out there, feel free to make any donation or uh, send a recommendation of a place to teach. And uh, thank you. Cool. And, hey, I hope you reach your goal. And, um, hey, did you forget about your Wait. cooking? Oh no, that's just got to simmer all day. That's okay. the uh, that's the maitake double extract, so that's just going to bubble and bubble until it's reduced by half. So that's like a six to eight hour process. Gotcha. Okay, I just want to remind you. Hey, man, I appreciate yeah, your time, and uh, I'll be hitting you up soon. Awesome.